people who are in the waiting room. My name is Maria Desmondi. I'm the owner of Cardinal Rule Press. We are a children's picture book just, um, publisher. Sorry, I'm trying to do like three, three things at once. We're not a distributor, we're a publishing company. Um, we are based out of Michigan and we are thrilled to be able to offer this panel to help aspiring writers talk to people in the industry, get some insider scoop, hear what's happening in the industry right now, ask us questions. So we today have Adam Blackman and Adam is just kind of working on getting his um, audio working. And we also have Stephanie Hansen. So Adam, let's see, um, can you try talking and we'll see if we can hear you. We cannot hear you. Okay, you keep working on that and Stephanie and I will go ahead and get started. So Stephanie, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Tell everyone a little bit about your journey into the publishing industry and what you currently do, where you work, all that good stuff. Yeah, uh, hi everybody, I'm Stephanie Hansen. I'm the owner of Metamorphosis Literary Agency. Um, I did have a different path into the industry as um, in school, I had radiation shortly thereafter. I had an illness that rendered me severely and unilaterally deaf. So I had to re-navigate, but I worked with a literary magazine as an editor. I also did consulting with a Hollywood book and film agent, Michelle Wallerstein. And um, now I've been with Metamorphosis for over six years. Um, I've placed with major houses, with foreign translation, with foreign publishers, uh, audio producers, film producers, as well as gaming app companies. So okay. yeah, that's been, um, I five years ago, I would have never expected that to be the route that the publishing industry took. Uh, and it started with romance, but now it's getting more into fantasy and science fiction. Uh, young adult and adult. So that's been a lot of fun to see books adapted to gaming, app, you know, different games. That's a lot of fun. That is really neat. And I never knew that Stephanie and I met because she placed one of her, she represented um, Michelle McAvoy and she placed her with our company with the book Cookie and Milk. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And my journey into the industry, um, and thank you so much, everyone who's joining us. Tell us where you're tuning in from. We have friends from Florida, from British Columbia, Asheville, North Carolina. So my journey into the industry, I was an educator for just over a decade, and I wrote a book called Spaghetti in a Hot Dog Bun, and this was in 2005 or six. I wrote the book, and I submitted it, and at this time, the submissions were were very different. I submitted it um, through mail. Uh, so I would, you know, print out the manuscript and send it in the mail to, I think it was 90 different publishers. I used a wonderful book that they still have in print by Reader's Digest. It's called Children's Ill Illustrators and Authors um, Market. I'll put a link to it in the um, chat so you can see that. But I just went through the book. I found publishers across the country that might fit the need of what I was looking for. Um, I found I signed with um, one local publisher, and it was a unique in, um, situation. I guess nowadays you would call that hybrid because I did have to put money into the project. Um, Spaghetti and the Hot Dog Bun started selling, and I was making more money on that writing than I was teaching, so I resigned from teaching and continued to write. And then I, I just kind of didn't want the limelight to be on myself anymore, and so I started Cardinal Rule Press. And um, that's where Adam works. Adam is our acquisitions editor. So along with an intern, he reads hundreds of thousands of um, manuscripts uh, that come uh, across our plate. And so we focus mainly on realistic fiction. So that's what I do now is I'm publisher of Cardinal Rule Press. Adam, do you have volume? I hope so. Do yes. I? Okay, you. great. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, um, go gosh, ahead and tell was... us a little bit about your journey into the industry. Okay, um, so I, well, I've always loved writing and wanted to write, um, and I got an MFA in fiction, not for children and young adults, um, but that was back in the um, mid 2000s. Um, and coming out of that, though, um, rather than going into publishing, I just wanted to kind of write it on the side. I was, um, was and have been working in nonprofits for 20 years now, um, and sort of managing different nonprofit spaces, um, social enterprises and so forth. 
Um, uh, however, a few years ago, I was like, oh gosh, I'm getting too hectic with all my like my responsibilities. I'm climbing up the wrong ladder and I really wanna be writing. So let's get back to it and kind of pair back to what's most important in my life. Uh, the fact that I was turning 40 was definitely related. Um, and so I, um, I left my job and I started to freelance as a teaching artist, like teaching writing uh, in schools and community settings, as well as um, some like civic engagement courses. And then, um, and my son was four. And so I really threw myself, I realized that my, my most important literary experiences uh, um, were not going to be with like what my planned um, cobbled together short story collection was going to be for adults, but actually in bedtime and, and reading with him. And so we just started making up more and more stories. I started to get more interested in it. And I um, really just, you know, did a sort of self-education with all the amazing million resources that are out there, starting with SCBWI, um, and then kind of moving on through like the, the you know, publishing Twitterverse. Um, and um, I would say that, you know, as a writer, um, but also serendipitously now as an editor, um, one of the best things for me was to um, uh, work with a, a mentorship program. Um, there is one called PB Chat that was starting up. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the, the every other week um, Twitter chats that they do um, and their mentorship program, which is really great. Um, and it was just it was just the best thing for me because um, it really helped me hone manuscripts um, that have ultimately helped me um, uh, get agented, but also helped me connect. Um, with with someone who connected me with Maria. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how, um, you know, during the pandemic, as my, um, you know, kind of push into schools gigs all dried up, um, the, um, the opportunity to work with this press, uh, because I was at that point sort of agenting or um, interning with a literary agent um, and uh, was kind of exploring those avenues a bit more. And so um, that's how I, I started, met Maria and started working with her. Um, and she's mentioned to me that it was because I had made a lot of connections along the way that that was part of what, um, you, know, you know, drew her to offer me the position. Um, and so, um, you know, all of the kind of connecting that you do, I would just try to toss that out there, you know, just saying yes to things, even if you don't know where they're gonna lead can be really great. Um, yeah, that's a great, great yeah. introduction, Adam. And I think it's important to point <clears throat> that it's it's not a um, it's not an A B C. It's not like a linear um, journey. Oftentimes, it's going to take you different places uh, that you didn't think you were going to go. Um, but I think getting experiences in all different areas of um, writing and really becoming a part of the community, I think that's really key. Um, and that's where we're going to go today. So Adam, did you have anything else that you wanted to say? I apologize. Um, just to end up with um, what my role is um, as acquisitions editor um, in the beginning, but the, the first uh, season of submissions, I just you know read everything and my role kind of ended there, um, but it has evolved mm -hmm. um, and to, to be more about developing writers um, and, so, and developing our relationship with both writers and agents mm -hmm. um, so that it starts with the pre-acquisition process, gets into the acquisition, and then it gets into the development, uh, the sort of um, after acquisition editing for, for publication. So it's a, it's a wider, it went from being like, okay, submission time was when I worked uh, with Cardinal Press to now it's, it's, it's year round, but it's, it's this whole process. Yeah, it really is. And um, and so what we're going to do today, thank you so much, Adam and Stephanie, is we're going to share with you some of our um, experiences as, uh, you know, being in the industry, um, do's and don'ts for sure. Um, and any questions you have, this is your place to ask. And I think, I think one of the greatest things about the industry is that people are um, very willing to answer questions and you know, through a lot of Googling and podcasts. That's how I learned to, I, I knew nothing about publishing before I started the company. Um, and we just acquired another company. And so we're at, we've passed the, that company we acquired sold 3 million books. We sold over a million books. So we're, we're definitely growing. And so it's, 
I'm just going to say for somebody who went to school to become a teacher, because of the way the industry is now, everyone shares online, they share through free webinars, they share through podcasts, conferences, all of that has helped me to get where I am today, and it will help you as well. Um, so definitely lean into events like this because um, you can get a lot of information. So let's talk first about the writing. Stephanie, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you. And again, for those of you in the room, it's either children's picture books, it can be middle grade, it can be young adult, it can be adult. So let's say, Stephanie, I'm ready. I have a manuscript. I want to submit it. What would you say, you know, hold up, hold off, put the brakes on before I do anything else? What would you say? advise me to do? Well, first, I would congratulate whoever, I would congratulate you for uh, finishing a book because that's a uh, feat in and of itself. And, but from there, I would, um, before submitting, sending it to anyone, publishing it, it definitely needs another pair of eyes on it. At least, you know, I would say at least three. Um, but that can be done in multiple ways. Some people have found great critique groups through, I think SCBWI does a wonderful job of organizing critique groups. And uh, what's important about a critique group is you want members that uplift you, but also will point out if there are plot holes, if something isn't working, they will give you constructive criticism, not, not just a bash, you know, that you don't want someone to just bash a manuscript entirely, but to point out what is working and what is not. Um, other people, if you don't do critique groups, some people do alpha and beta readers, um, and that can be a wonderful way to see what's working, what's not working. Uh, if it's following the formula for whatever genre you're writing or not, if the dialogue feels authentic or forced. Um, just every single facet like that. Uh, after that, after you've made revisions and you you feel that the story is pretty well intact, I would say you also need someone to look at the wording of every sentence to be sure that it is as polished as it can be before you query people or publish or anything like that. I think that's wonderful advice. And <clears throat> for a company who we are weeding through so many manuscripts at this point, um, and our submissions are currently in our open phase because uh, we're a small company. We only open a few times a year. Um, we read and find so much value in your cover letter. And so sometimes we don't even get to your manuscript if we are stopped on the cover letter. Can you speak a little more to that, Adam? Um, sure. Um... I think there, the essentials in a cover letter, uh, especially with, with picture books, are um, one thing I would say brevity uh, would be great. Like we, we don't need a full biography. The bio should be related to what you're, um, what you're submitting. And so, um, well, th those additional little bits of color can be uh, about your you know, personal life or the inspiration behind the story um, can be nice and lovely remember that we've got it's it's me and an intern and we've got thousands of, of submissions to go through and so um so just being to the point is really helpful um so what that's the the elements of a of a of a cover letter and query are usually the same where you're kind of introducing the the manuscript you uh you know mention its word count you um uh do a do a short pitch of of what the story is, um, I include some comp titles, the purpose of the comp titles, we just you know, glance at them, they give me two things. Um, they just let me know um, if you are kind of thinking currently within the market and so are you know, engaged not just in the writing community but in the reading community um, by going to, going to bookstores, seeing what's being published um, and are really thinking in terms of how does your manuscript uh, fit uh, on actual physical uh, shelves where they might be sold and seen. And then, um, and so that that helps us understand kind of where you're coming from just by that aspect of things. Um, and then it also helps uh, us place uh, the, the the manuscript. Is it, fun, you know, tonally? Is it, uh, is it funny? Does it go with other funny books? Does it, does it go with other like sort of, um, you know, how-to-ish kind of books or those kinds of things? 
Um, so, so all of those things, just keep it brief, uh, more brief than I just was. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's wonderful. And the cover letter is important. And you said something. So really understanding the market, researching what are books that are already in the market that are similar to your, your manuscript? Why is your book different? Why would we want to publish your book if there's already something out there like that? And how do you find that information out? I would say there are definitely, and maybe um, Stephanie and Adam can add to this, but there are definitely two free newsletters that I read. Um, I try to read them daily because they give me insights. For example, um, I just read recently that, um, you know, so many manus so many uh, picture books are being featured in New York City. They said, okay, let's get out of New York City. We've just got so many settings in New York City. And I'm like, we've got a title in New York City coming out next year. Um, but it just gives you an insight to what's really, what, it, what are they looking for and what is needed. So one is Publishers Weekly and the other is Shelf Awareness. And um, they have specific newsletters that you can sign up for for free. So if you're writing a picture book, they have um, Publishers Weekly, Children's Book Insider, um, and you just Google it, sign up, and you can get the inside scoop on, on what they're looking for. Anything else, Stephanie or Adam, as far as industry news? Yeah, I would say as an agent, what's somewhat difficult for us is, I mean, uh, depending on whether it's picture book, no, both. I, if you sign with a major house today, your book won't release for at least two years, more than likely. And that is with everything can be set up to put it in its best position. Uh, you need to go through the editorial process. If you have illustrations, you need to go through that entire process. Trade reviews went six months plus before release to be able to review it. And you really would like to set it up so that you have those reviews. Um, but so just those things takes a year and at least in and of itself. So when we are looking for what readers want, we're looking for what readers will want in two to three years. So it's kind of, um, that's why, you know, everyone wants a concrete answer of what's, you know, what's selling, what are we going to buy? And sometimes that's what makes it difficult as agents and editors and what we're looking for is years down the line. And it's important to note, <clears throat> so when Stephanie and Adam were talking about getting your manuscript ready, you might get that manuscript ready and say, okay, I'm going to take this path. I'm now, I'm not looking for a publisher. I'm looking for an agent. I want an agent to represent me. And that would be like what Stephanie's doing. Or you might say, I'm going to try the route without an agent and I'm just going to look for a publisher. And if that's the case, you're going to want to have to find a publisher that accepts <clears throat> you without an agent. Sorry, I'm losing my voice over here. So um, it's really a, a fork in the road that you have to make that decision to have an agent or not to have an agent. Um, Stephanie, do you want to speak, of course, to having an agent? Oh, yeah. I mean, I support all uh, routes and I think certain genres are more successful di with different um, actions. But with literary representation, that is what you need to have your manuscript put in front of major houses. Every once in a while, major houses will have windows where they do open up to the public. Um, but I still suggest that either you have a, an agent or you're part of a group like the Authors Guild where you have people with publishing contract experience that can look at those contracts on your behalf and help you negotiate so that you receive the best deal possible. Um, with having an agent with Metamorphosis, we do operate a little bit outside of the box because we understand that not every author's journey is the same. Not everyone is going to go with a major house, be a front runner, front list title that hits New York Times on release day, you know, uh, bestseller list. Uh, everyone's journey is a little different. And actually the percentage of authors that go that route are very, very minimal. Um, many authors might publish with a small press or a mid-sized house first, and then after they show that they work well with the editorial team, that they promote their book, that they are fully engaged as authors, then they might, in the next book, sign with a larger house. And we've actually had quite a few authors do things like that. Uh, LaRonda gardner Middlemiss, her book, um, I Love Me is with Beaming Books, which is a mid-sized Christian house. Um, and then her next book, Do You See Me? It, it 
re-sign that with a Macmillan imprint. So that's just an example of an author that with our agency, we like to, we don't, we try not to leave any author behind. So if they don't place with a major house, we don't just let them go or let go of that manuscript. Sometimes we work with them while they place with a small house or a mid-sized house and then continue on with the, we're more about the author's career than just one manuscript. We also have often with small presses and mid-sized houses um, partnered those deals with audiobook deals that are advanced pain that help um, make their reach greater. Um, and so that's kind of something also that we do a little bit outside of the box, but I feel like I went off on a tangent there and <laughs> deviated a, from the No, it's, it's a good tangent. This is all wonderful information. I did write down the Authors Guild in here because um, we did have an author, um, Pauline, who uh, who she was with the Authors Guild and they went line by line with our contract. And it was very helpful to her because she didn't have an attorney that she was paying to go through our contract. And the Authors Guild supported her in that process in really great ways. Um, so the Authors Guild is a great organization. Um, so let's talk a little bit. We talked a little bit about the do's on things that you do want to do. You want to be critiqued um, before submitting your manuscript. You want to do your research. You want to be well-versed in the industry. You want to know what's out there. Um, what are some of the things we don't want you to be doing? What are some of the things, Adam, we do not want you to be doing when submitting? I'll start. How about I start? <laughs> it's super simple. And um, our submission guidelines, um, if you read them on our website, they're about that long. So it, it's really short. And they're bullet points because, you know, I'm a mother of three and I really can't read much other than bullet points these days. So it's simple and we want you to take the time and see what are the submission guidelines. And one of them says realistic fiction. That's the only thing that we publish. We want um, children, our books to be mirrors and windows for children. We want them to be able to see themselves in, in the pictures of our book, in the stories of our books or to be able to imagine themselves. And so we do not take science fiction, we do not take dancing dinosaurs or singing fish. And oftentimes those are the manuscripts that come across our um, inbox and they immediately get deleted. And you know, <clears throat> we recognize that that person didn't take the time to go through what the directions were and they were just blind submitting to whoever. Um, sometimes not addressing an editor by name. If, if you can find the name of the editor, Adam's name is on our website. I think it's important to use his name in the cover letter um, since that's who you're going to be speaking to. And I will put the link to the book I'm speaking of because they do put um, the current editor's names in there. Um, so I think those are some, some just, you know, uh, it would be, what's it called? Like manners or um, etiquette. I would say submission etiquette. Adam, what do you think? It, definitely. I would piggyback on that to say, um, just don't submit anywhere when you're, you're don't, don't try to squeak through something that you think you can squeak through, like follow the guidelines basically. Um, so for us, um, in, in addition to the realistic side of things, I noticed a lot of times we get stuff that actually basically verges on nonfiction. Um, and we just have never, that's just not what we do. Um, so it's, it's kind of, a, it, it's, it's sort of a waste of your time to do that. And it doesn't actually, um, you know, help if you, you know, there are plenty of people who um, I see their names come up submission season after submission season, and, I, and I'm rooting for them because it's like, oh, that last manuscript didn't quite do it. But, um, you know, maybe this one will, right. But if, if I see your name and I connect it to, oh, this person didn't follow the guidelines in the past, this is a sort of, you know, unconscious bias thing where I just will probably less take it a little less seriously right off the bat, even before I get to the new submission. Um, so it's just, it is kind of part of the, the larger etiquette to just, um, you know, follow the guidelines uh, closely. Um, I think another thing I would say, um, and I think the dotes, blend into the do's is formatting actually is really important. Um, so making something a very legible, readable format um, is very helpful. And with picture books specifically, um, please look at the way that people do art notes uh, because um, there, there are a number of different ways 
uh, but really you want the, the, the actual text in the manuscript to be the, the, the most pronounced part. And then the art notes are sort of, if you can separate them off to the side, that's ideal um, for me, because think about how you read the book. You don't read the art notes. If you are working with your critique, critique group and uh, you know someone else reads the book to you, they're not gonna read the art notes just as they wouldn't when it's finally published. And so you really wanna be able to have a clean read through um, and not to the, not to say to art to art to art note or not to art note is its own separate conversation. But um, the point is when you use them, um, how they are like look on the page actually can, you know, make things easier or harder for the reader. Yeah, and um, Stephanie, I want you to have a chance to give your feedback on the don'ts. But I did, I did see a question from um, Valerie McPherson, and she had mentioned. In general, I think we are told not to resubmit to the same place if rejected. And I think that's really preference because I know I'm, my son is mowing the lawn. Sorry, it's loud. <laughs> Saturday, everybody. Um, I'm actually looking forward to some, I'm looking for some names to come across our um, in inbox again, because we, you know, there are a manuscripts and writing styles that we really enjoy, but it's not what we're looking for at the time. So I'm open to resubmissions. And I must know that we are we are very well connected. And if I found a manuscript in our um, you know, submissions that I think would be a really great fit for one of my friends, a colleague, I would be happy to pass it along to them as well. Stephanie, any um, thing to add to the don'ts? I would just add, I've had authors, I think even more so lately, call me out of the blue. Um, and for me, I'm with my deafness, it's really important that I have phone calls when there isn't background noise. Otherwise I'll really struggle. My, my new phone does have live captions so that somewhat helps. But I mean, even my, even the agents at the agency and the editors that I talk to know that I prefer scheduled phone calls, not just a phone call out of the blue. And maybe that's everyone these days, I don't know. But um, it, I prefer digital submissions. That's how our guidelines are laid out. When I'm open, um, a phone call the blue won't co come across well for me. Wonderful. And we, you know, we haven't done a um, panel in a few months and we have been using um, closed caption. And I apologize that I did not turn that on, Stephanie, because you're reminding me how important that can be for individuals who are listening. Now, Cassie Silva did say, to clarify, you want to see a new piece resubmitted by the same author. Um, not necessarily. So, Adam, can you speak to R&Rs? So, R&Rs, um, uh, in, in, in case you don't know, is uh, re revise and resubmit. Um, and so, um, basically, if we receive a manuscript, we think it's got a promise, but we're not ready to make an offer on it. Um, we might send back a letter that's more detailed, uh, inviting you to make certain revisions and be able to resubmit that manuscript. Um, because just to back up to that earlier point, um, yes, we're happy to see um, people submit different stories from uh, from one you know submission window to the next, but not necessarily the same one unless we've invited that one back. So that's what the revise and resubmit process is for. And so um, it is not a guarantee of publication. Um, it is something where personally, I look at it as a way to cultivate the relationship with uh, you as an author um, and to offer what I can to help you to improve your manuscript. My, I only do that when I am hoping that the, the revision that comes back would be something that we could publish, um, even though I can't guarantee it. So I'm not doing this just to like, just as a, a charity or anything. Um, and I don't, I, and, and to, or to give a false promise. It's, it is with that intention, um, but um, that's the idea. And so I think one thing I meant to say in the dues column, um, which would be related to the revise and resubmit is time. Time is a really crucial ingredient. So uh, in the revision process and in receiving feedback and then being able to apply it to your manuscript. And so that applies when you're within your critique group setting. I think you also can basically, when um, Stephanie mentioned having three sets of eyes, 
those sets of eyes can sometimes be your own eyes three months later, you know? So if you put something down, walk away, work on other projects, do other things and come back, you will see things fresh. It, it, it is invariable. For some people, for, you know, that process can be two hours. Some people that's like after they go for a run and come back. Uh, for some people it's, uh, you know, lengthier, but I, it just, I think that's really important. And so where that applies to R&Rs is don't just take that R&R, &R, do a quick turnaround and send it right back. That's not what I'm looking for. There's no time, there's no time constraint on that. Um, you know, especially since we have a, a submission window in fall and then one in like early winter, and they're both part of the same process where we don't make our final decisions until the end of that second window, um, then, you know, you have until that time to resubmit. That's just for that year. Let's say you submitted at the end of January. We said we really are interested in, you know, I really like this. I wouldn't, um, you know, uh, acquire it now, but here's some R&R, &R, you know, suggestions and so forth. Um, and you can feel free to query this uh, or, you know, submit this again next fall. When we go. Um, that gives you plenty of time um, to work on that. So yeah, and we've actually taken some um, R and Rs and published them, which is you know really great um, yeah. for those of you listening. And I will also say that um, how long um, S K Wanger asked how long should an author wait to inquire about an R and R? Do you always respond to those? <clears throat> it's different with every different um, publishing house, which I think is the hardest thing. And, you know, making a spreadsheet to, to who you submit to, you know, what, what are their guidelines? We used to, Adam used to write feedback for um, almost every submission that we, <clears throat> excuse me, that we got at the beginning because we didn't have as many submissions when he first started working with us and he'd give feedback on all of them. And now there's just not time to give feedback on all of those um, manuscripts. So it just depends on the publishing house. Stephanie, anything else to add for don'ts on submissions? Uh, I think that we have covered it all. Um, I don't get as upset if people go outside of genres. It is something good to pay attention to, but I also realize that authors, with how competitive the market is, they do tend to the number of submissions that are required for success has increased. Um, so I do kind of understand when people, but the problem is, is the reason why, for instance, I put certain genres that I'm shopping is because I know that I right now will have the best success placing those. So when, when you send me something that is outside of that, I will unfortunately more than likely, even if it's a stellar manuscript, have to reject it because it's just not where my current process as an agent is having, you know, I'm having success. So I would prefer you sign with an agent who is having success with that specific genre right now. Um, and so I, I would just say, don't take rejection, um, Personally, there's so many different things in this industry that allow for success or don't. Uh, it's very objective, su or sorry, su subjective. Um, and so just don't take it personally, keep at it, continue building your craft and find where you do, where you can find your success and um, celebrate others' successes, be part of the community and really find a way to enjoy your publishing journey. And finding a way to celebrate with others and to find your own journey. Part of that is building your platform. So you're writing, you're submitting, and you're like, what do I do in the meantime? I just want to, I want to go from A to Z. I want to make it. Start a blog. I know people have said, oh, blogs, they're, they're archaic. They are not archaic. They're still, um, creating a digital footprint for you. So you can share some of your writing journey on a blog. Um, take, take the audience through the process that you're going through. What does your writing um, craft look like? What does your writing spot look like? What does your process look like? Um, share all of that either in a blog or hop on a social media platform that you're comfortable with. You don't need to be everywhere. You need to be somewhere though. You should be somewhere. Um, and we find that aspiring writers um, connecting on Twitter is a really great place and on, um, on Instagram as well. So share part of your process and start connecting with different people in the community and building that platform because that platform is key when you do publish. Will we 
sign with an author who doesn't have a platform? Absolutely. Um, but do we like an author to have a platform? Absolutely, we do. But um, we do, yes, celebrate every step. And part of that, Cindy, um, I see Cindy Schrauben, who is one of our authors, um, part of the content that she has for her social media is celebrating other writers. So being a, you know, you might say, well, what can I share on social media? You can share other books that are coming out by other colleagues for you. All right. Um, for Adam and Maria, will you respond to every submission once you go through them in February? We do not. We no longer submit or respond to every single one. And I, gosh, I wish we could, um, but we're a small team and um, we are definitely not scholastic, right? Like we're not, we're not one of the big guys, that's for sure. And I, I wish we had the time to be able to do that. But we do offer things like this to try to support the community. Um, and, you know, anyone has a follow-up question, you're welcome to um, email me. I will put my personal email in the, um, the group here. So are there any other questions? Oh, they're, they're coming at us. Um, Apart from realistic and representative stories, are there any particular themes or, or stories that fill gaps in the market that you were looking for at the moment? Um, do you want to answer that one, Adam? Anything that we're looking for that fills a gap? Actually, we're really looking for um, stories that might feature foster families um, and alternative family structures and so forth. And, and so um, that, that's something that I haven't seen much of. Yes, and I, our family is a foster family, and we um, have been for this year. And to get my own biological children prepared for the journey, um, the books were not good. <laughs> and so I said, there's a gap in the market. We need to fill this gap. Let's, let's get, and it doesn't have to be about a foster family, but alternative family structures um, to be able to help your, bring up that conversation with your children. Um, all right. Thank you. Any, okay. There's another one. Let's see. Um, I'm interested in your response to general trends and picture book interests of children. My local children's librarians noted huge, huge trends in graphic stories, your observations on that and other interest trends. Do you want to speak to that, Stephanie, as we wrap things up? Oh, sure. Um, I do kind of fill a niche market when it comes to picture books. A lot of the picture books that I represent are, um, they're about disabilities and children with disabilities. Uh, I'm part of the deaf and hard of hearing community. I recently signed three books. Uh, we, I can't remember which ones have been announced right off the top of my head. Uh, that one hasn't. Uh, one with West Margin is coming out, and that's an Ingram imprint out of California. Um, they're a wonderful mid-sized house. They helped elevate Angela Shante, uh, her noisy classroom series, as well as When My Cousins Come to Town. It's been best-selling, as well as receive awards, so we've really loved working with them. Uh, Anitra Schulte, Anitra Rose Schulte signed with Two Lions and her book. Um, is also with that in that same niche. And so I really tend to focus on what selling who is looking for books about blind children. Uh, we have one coming out through a penguin imprint. Um, and so I really do kind of follow that niche and a lot of the books uh, are, that I represent and markets that I'm looking at are within that. Um, so I don't know if I can speak to the publishing industry as a whole with picture book. Uh, with middle grade, I have to put this one up. Naomi Teitelbaum Ends the World released this month through a Simon & Schuster imprint. And it is fantasy, so instead of realistic, but it's, it's kind of a bridge. So Naomi's celebrating her bat mitzvah and receives a golem who ends up being magical, uh, which at first is great until he, you know, causes horrible demise all over town and Naomi and her friends kind of have to go and try to save the day. But what I love about what's important with middle grade is interlaced through the story, it speaks of justice and self-care and important topics for kids of that age. But so that's why I like with the unrealistic fiction is you can kind of thread important topics like that in an 
I feel like possibly easily digestible form for kids of those age. Uh, I agree with the adoption. That is an important topic that isn't covered. Just like disabilities, I feel like it's kind of a spot in the market that hasn't received um, enough attention. I also feel that um, I think it's kind of coming around, but we're not there yet. But the celebration of LGBTQ families, um, I want kiddos with two moms and two dads to be able to read books that mirror that so that they don't. Um, I just feel like that's also a spot in the market that we need to fill, especially with picture books. Um, and yeah, I could go on and on and on. I feel like I did the tangent thing again. Sorry. That's okay. No, it's wonderful. And oh. as, as you can see, I think the really neat part about people who are in the work is we are passionate about certain things. Um, and that's why we show up on a Saturday to talk to you because we truly love the work that we do. Um, I can't tell you a day I don't enjoy waking up and doing this work. And it's because I have a focus on a certain part of the market. You're, we're not trying to do all the things, we're trying to do something. Um, I do want to answer another question, then we'll wrap things up at uh, quarter two. But um, someone did ask, do, 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 how do you know when you find a winner in your inbox? So our process is to narrow down um, thousands to hundreds to 50 to 25 to 10. And then when we get to 10 manuscripts, what we do is we have beta readers. And those readers, I think we usually have about 10 of them. They consist of maybe um, one of our editorial or um, interns from a local university who is studying literature and English. It has parents of children who are the picture book age. Um, we actually have children who are picture book age read the book um, and educators. And so we have a slew of individuals who read the book and comment on that those 10 titles to help us to narrow it down. So we really do um, take feedback on those. And then um, let's see, I'm assuming that writers who write stories featuring alternative family structures should be writers who have an alternative structure themselves. Yes, I do think you wanna be careful. Um, you want it to be authentic for sure. Um, and I think it, it when it is authentic, it's going to come off even more passionate. You're going to have so much more passion and love behind the story um, because you've maybe lived that story. So for example, um, I wrote a story uh, before I became publisher. I, I Like I had mentioned, I was doing some writing myself. And um, one of our best-selling titles is Chocolate Milk, Por Favor. And it's a story about one of my own students when I was a teacher who came to our classroom. He spoke zero English. He came to my classroom on day three of living in the United States, and he flourished because of the other children in my classroom. Actions speak louder than words. They, they took, they held his hand, they showed him what to do, they showed him through their actions. And so I got permission through that family to write that book, and um, I guess my point is there's just so much passion behind that. And do I speak Spanish? I do not speak Spanish, but that was a, a personal experience that I had with a student. Um, so yes, and you know, I think people, yeah, we are a company that is open to tough topics um, because that's what we, we feel like books are a bridge to families and um, that you know delivery of a, a tough topic or a tough conversation, but not all publishers are. So you definitely want to, um, see that. And Sarah asked, uh, how many do we publish from that 10? Um, in the past, it was three, but we just acquired another company. And so we're continuing to add on to that as we grow and have a bigger budget. So this has been wonderful. And I just, I want to really thank Stephanie and Adam for their time today um, and for being here to answer questions. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, if you have any other questions, I will put my email here. We will send out the recording because I think we had close to 150 sign up for this um, this panel uh, and not everyone's here so the replay will be available you can reach out to me with any questions and please look for an email sometime on Monday with some follow-up links from today's panel thank you so much everyone and please keep writing and keep on submitting have a great day everyone bye bye everyone